me introduce uh, our guest of honor and author. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and preview a little bit about what we will do. Um, so as you heard, Safwan runs the Global Centers uh, here at Columbia. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with him, that means that he directs global initiatives and is responsible for building out this network of centers, uh, which are now in places like Milan, Beijing, Istanbul, Mumbai, Nairobi, Paris, Rio, Santiago, and most recently Tunis. Not a coincidence. Okay. Um, and uh, Safa's background is in uh, is, is really eclectic in a lot of ways. He came. He was trained as a industrial engineer, earned his doctorate degree at Stanford University, he joined Columbia's business school faculty a couple of decades ago, he is now also a senior research scholar at SEPA, and I think you can hear in that resume uh, some, some of where this book came from, a very curious, searching individual who has spent the last six, seven years um, after having grown up in Jordan. Um, trying to make sense of the Arab Spring and its aftermath, and that uh, lit upon Tunisia, a place you knew reasonably well before, as, a, as a, an intriguing anomaly, as he chose to describe it in the, in the subtitle, and that'll be the basis for our conversation. I cannot claim to know Tunisia as well as um, Safran by any stretch. I have worked there a couple of times. I was there during the revolution as a correspondent for the New Yorker. Um, so I have impressions I certainly did a lot of reading. Uh, but I found this book enriching and uh, original in a lot of its sort of use of history and analysis and contemporary interviews. And I thought, so we'll talk for a while and then we'll invite your questions probably after about 40 minutes or so. And we have a 7.30 reception. And we keep turning this way. Uh, reception and uh, a book signing after our discussion. So I, thought, I made some notes, but I thought maybe we'd start with the context that you create for your examination, both geographical and, and historical, um, and talk about some of the hypotheses that you introduce about Tunisian exceptionalism in North Africa and the Arab world. Um, and then move from that background to the revolution and then to the aftermath, and maybe we'll finish kind of looking ahead about so how durable some of these achievements may or may not be. So, um, you know, you, one of the ideas that you introduced early is this sense of Tunisia going back to the Ottoman period, I think, or even earlier, as belonging, seeing itself as belonging to a Euro Mediterranean certainly more than uh, North African sphere or, or an Arab sphere. So can you start by just describing what it is that you discover about Tunisian nationalism, Tunisian identity, that is located in this relationship with Europe rather than other parts of its geography? Thank you, Steve. So first of all, thank you, Steve, for doing this with me. I could not agree with that ask for a better interlocutor uh, and Steve is being very modest I think you know, he knows Tunisia very well and has written quite a bit about Tunisia and uh, was there during the Casbah protests which uh, followed the, the uh, ouster of uh, Ben Ali in 2011 and thank you Shani and uh, Paul for hosting this it's wonderful to be here thank you all for coming here this evening so I think I mean, there is a lot to be said about a Tunisian identity, and that came to me as a bit of a surprise. I mean, I started this quest uh, because I was there uh, in the region when the Arab Spring happened. Uh, as Steve mentioned, um, I am from Jordan. I spent much of the past decade uh, through my work with Colombia, but through other uh, education initiatives, spending a lot of time in the region, and that exposed me quite a bit to some of the factors that I think uh, underscore uh, some of the tensions that exist in the region today. Um, with the Arab Spring, and the, which started in Tunisia and then unfolded elsewhere, and as we know, has resulted in humanitarian crises and failed states and so on, Tunisia stood out because it uh, has so far succeeded. I mean, it's a qualified success, and we've talked about the future where Tunisia is today, uh, and I had 
a hypothesis, and I knew some things about Tunisia, but there were some things that I did not appreciate before I started this research. One of them is this notion of an identity that is, I think, very um, expansive and broad and has many different dimensions to it that come together, um, in my mind, um, in a very specific manner uh, that defines a, a Tunisian sort of you know, culture, a Tunisian individual, uh, a Tunisian identity as not having to make a choice, if you will, between European or Arab, uh, African, Muslim or otherwise. And I think that part of the reason is uh, it's a country that has enjoyed a very rich civilizational history you know, that started with the um, Phoenicians you know, descending upon Carthage from uh, Lebanon back in the 9th century before Common Era. Uh, you know, Carthage played a very important role in the Mediterranean, as you know. Uh, the Romans established Carthage then as the uh, uh, capital of the African province. Um, you had the Byzantines there, you had the Vandals for, for a brief period, you had the Berber uh, makeup, uh, genetic makeup, if you will, or cultural uh, uh, heritage of uh, Tunisians, and then you had the Arab and Muslim uh, world come in. And during Ottoman times, Tunisia from the get-go was a semi-autonomous province of uh, the Ottoman Empire. So it always maintained a certain independence, a certain autonomy, played a very important role um, in the Mediterranean and in the, uh, in the world, uh, in that world at large, um, and which has really made it um, very different and somewhat unique in terms of, uh, of that identity uh, definition. It also, you know, under the, the Romans, if, 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 the uh, African province, right, and then the uh, Arabs uh, refer to this Africa, which is the Arab world for Africa. So Tunisia is very proud of having uh, known their name to the to the continent. So it's it's very, you know, I say in the book, you know, it is Occidental, it is Oriental, it is Arab and Muslim, and it is Berber, and it's all of those things. But at the end, it's Tunisian, and there's a specificity to that Tunisian identity. Well, sometimes when you look around at nation states uh, and try to find some that seem to be doing something well, say, educating their publics or providing social equality, some of the models that you uh, land on tend sometimes are small and socially cohesive. It makes it easier to improve things from time to time. So that's true sort of to each 11 million people, 99% Sunni. Um, no significant uh, tribalism, <coughs> except maybe some legacies in the South more expressed in family, but, but heavily uh, urbanized. And so it wasn't surprising, I suppose, that um, a country that had modernized so much, except for its politics, would become a revolutionary state. But before we get to the revolution, you spend a good deal of time talking about what you call reformism after independence. And it is remarkable to be reminded both uh, in Bordiba and even under Ben Ali, the distinctive dis national decision to enfranchise women's education, to build a mixed uh, secular model that wasn't um, it was distinct from all of the other Bath Party models and so forth. And so I guess my, the form of my question is, how did this society manage to cohere around the empowerment of women through education for so long, uh, through so many seasons of political weather in the Arab world, you know, the Iranian revolution and the rest? So you talk about the homogeneity of the uh, Tunisian population, and that's you know what I think of as an environment of academic talent, right? And there were many other things that helped Tunisia. So its history, the civilizations that went through it, its geography, 
uh, being a small country on the Mediterranean uh, without the resource burden of uh, other rich Arab countries. Uh, you know, there are many factors that help it, including the homogeneity. But that homogeneity was not always there. So if you look at the 19th century, um, Tunisia was uh, made up of uh, you know, originally Berber, uh, Arab Muslims who lived there. But you had a significant Jewish community um, that numbered for independence upwards of 100,000. Um, in Jerba, you know, the island at the south of uh, Tunisia is home to the, the oldest synagogue in, uh, in Africa. Uh, you had a Christian population, you had Italian colons, uh, British colons, you had French, you had uh, uh, a very diverse society going on there. And I mention this because it's really important to note that the reformism uh, that Habib Bourguiba, the country's first president after independence in 1956, is given um, a lot of credit, and rightly so, uh, for, make, for, for building the modern nation that Tunisia has uh, emerged into. What was very enlightening for me as I conducted the research was that Bourguiba really rode on the shoulders of reformers who had paved the way from for him starting in the middle of the 19th century. And I think that you know, the reform movements that started in the middle of the 19th century also were helped not only by those environmental factors, if you will, but also by the historical civilizational factors, even including the way that Islam arrived to Tunisia and the way that it grew and developed and evolved uh, out of Kailouan uh, in the interior of the country. Uh, but to go back to the uh, heart of your question about reform, so you look at, uh, you know, Bergeva definitely had a vision. Uh, Bergeva uh, was benefited tremendously from the reform movements that came before him, uh, but he also was a product of the French colonial power, uh, which ruled Tunisia from 1881 until 1956. You know, he studied at Lycée Carnot in uh, Tunis at the South College and then went on to Sorbonne uh, to get his uh, university uh, degrees in, uh, in Paris, as did many of his compatriots. Um, so he <coughs> was very forward-thinking. In 1956, the moment that the country got its independence, uh, he adopted a, um, a family status called Constitut Personnel, uh, which gave women in Tunisia more rights than they enjoy today in any Arab country. I mean, for example, the abolishment of uh, polygamy, which is still practiced in Muslim communities throughout the Arab world, uh, legal. Um, it has been illegal in uh, Tunisia since 1956. But it turns out that Taha Haddad, uh, a scholar, an um, Islamic scholar, had in 1930 written a very important treatise, Imra'atuna fi Sharia wa Mishnama, our women in, or, or the status of women in Sharia and society, uh, published in 1930, in which he advocated for the end of polygamy. Uh, he advocated for equal rights uh, for women. He even advocated for abortion under certain circumstances. And this is a man who was a scholar at Zaytuna Mosque, uh, an 8th century mosque, which in uh, Muslim tradition has been a place of great learning and scholarship. At the time, of course, you know, the society was not ready uh, for his ideas. Um, but, you know, but I have not, of course, benefited from the works of people who had come before him. So that tradition of thinking uh, progressively uh, did not really start with independence, it did not start with Bourguiba. I mean, the country um, abolished slavery in 1846, 19 years before we did in this country. In 1863, and I should, by the way, recognize my research assistant, Reina. Where is Reina? Uh, Reina Davis, um, who uh, has been really instrumental to me uh, throughout this process. So when Reina and I started looking at, for example, what has been written on and, and, and the actual com written communications between Amos Perry, who was the American consul in Tunis, in 1863, he wrote uh, Ahmed Bey, the local Ottoman uh, ruler, asking him about the benefits of, uh, of abolishing slavery. Um, and uh, Hussein Basha, on behalf of Ahmed Bey, uh, wrote him very thoughtfully uh, about the economic and social benefits of, of, of that. So 
you had, uh, and there are many, many other examples, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about them, but I don't want to give them all away because I want people to get a book and, and, and read them. Uh, but so, so the, that tradition of reform had started a long time before, and, and let me just say one more thing, that Borgeva in 1956, when he introduced the family status code, uh, he solicited and got the support of the religious authorities in the country. And in arguing for the abolishment of polygamy, he used the same arguments that had been used more than a hundred years before them um, for the abolishment of slavery. And that even though uh, the Quran allows, and Islam allows for uh, a man to have up to four wives and allows uh, a person to have a slave uh, in their ownership, the conditions under which one can uh, enter into polygamous uh, relationships and conditions under which uh, he could own a slave was so difficult, if not impossible, to meet. So that's, that's super helpful. <coughs> First, me to ask you, how many uh, Tunisians are with this story? Good show. And how many of you, uh, how many non Tunisians have been to Tunisia? All right, so uh, a good number. Yeah. So you know that it's, uh, of course, the Tunisians know, but for the rest of you, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a remarkably uh, modernized middle-income country. It has structural youth unemployment, similar to what we find elsewhere in North Africa. But uh, in Tunis, you have really one of the most, uh, it's not too different from Oman, I suppose. Uh, but I remember standing during the Cosmo protests uh, in the students that had come out on Saturday, it was starting to get rough, and so you had to make a decision you were willing to stand in the middle of it, and lots of young people came down. They were basically day trippers to the protests, and there was a young woman, she maybe 30, standing on the edge of the crowd, holding a little sign that just said, peace in English. So I went up to her and said, what brings you here? She talked about the revolution. And I said, well, what do you do for them? She said, I work in a, tele a telephone marketing center selling gardening supplies to France, to French households. And I thought, okay, this, this city is so plugged into Europe. And then you'd ask anyone with a college education or even without, um, what model of democracy are you seeking to bring in? And you might think that they, that they would be, make reference to the global south, Brazil, India, or something. No, Switzerland, UK, Switzerland, <laughs> UK, Switzerland, UK. So um, it's really uh, a revolution that sprang from modernization. That modernization is rooted in the history you just described. But let's talk a little bit about the revolution. The Nobel Peace Prize went to the quartet, which are four civil society organizations that, that really anchored the transition from the revolution to the democracy, that's the constitution of democracy that's now there. One of those is the trade unions, the syndicate of trade unions. And this was the other sort of Johnny Reporter discovery that really knocked, knocked me over when I started just going into the tents during the hospital, I'm just staying in the tents, trying to, you know, mind having a stranger in your smelly tent. And uh, then you'd say to everyone, where are you from? And they're all from the south. Oh, how did you get here? They told us to get on the buses. Who's they? The unions. Everyone, the whole core of the occupation were basically union affiliated volunteer youth who had come up through an infrastructure in order to carry out this occupation. So explain to us what the significance of both the unions, the business association, the lawyers association, and the rest of the quartet is, and how, how would you place that in the Arab world? Is there any other country that has a structure like this? And so why did, why did France allow this? Why did uh, Ben Ali allow this? So, I mean, you're, there are three, three dimensions to what you just said that I want to go back to. Um, but let, let me start with uh, trying to directly answer your question. So, is there anything similar in the rest of the Arab world? You know, the, the, uh, 
uh, union, labor, the, the labor union movement in Egypt uh, started around the same time that it started in uh, Tunisia back in the late teens, early 1920s. Uh, what happened in Egypt, uh, as you know, Steve, is that uh, that union movement was basically crushed by Jamal Abdel Nasser uh, and really a shattering crush back in 1957. And from that point on, they had been bought by the regimes of uh, Nasser and then Sadat and then Mubarak, uh, that they actually played a negative role uh, in the revolution. And that's the only country where something similar could have emerged the way that it did in Tunisia. In Tunisia, the Union General Tunisienne Travail, which is the active um, uh, union with uh, dues paying members, uh, was founded in 1946. And it became so intertwined with the nationalist movement, uh, the anti colonial nationalist movement, that Farhat Hashem, who founded the union, and was assassinated by Le Man Rouge, which is a French terrorist organization back in 1952. Um, it was a result of the French looking at Fakhat Hashem as a greater threat than Habib Bourguiba was to them. Habib Bourguiba, they had, they had brought him under control. Habib Bourguiba was um, a negotiator. He was somebody that they could deal with. But the founder of the union, uh, was deemed by them to be the greatest threat. And throughout the Burgeva and Ben Ali regime, the union continued to exist and I would say even thrive, uh, despite the regime's efforts at times to crush it, to bring it under its control, but also at other times allowing it to thrive because the union was to the dictators, uh, both you know, Burgeva as much as he was originally and as well as he did for the country was at the end of the day a dictator who abused human rights and so on, or under the army, uh, it allowed for an outlet, a democratic outlet for the people of Tunisia. So um, it was sort of, you know, the relationship was um, ambivalent, let's say, between the regime and the union. Uh, the union in the 1990s was really brought under the control of the army in terms of its central leadership. And it started losing credibility as a union, but not at the local level. I mean, the great thing about the union is that, you know, after so many decades of existence, it had branches throughout the country, it became a grassroots movement, and even when the central leadership had lost credibility, the grassroots membership in the unions continued to be strong. Uh, we often talk about the Arab Spring had started in Tunisia in December 2017 when Mohammed Bouazizi. Um, famously uh, set himself on fire and died in hospital a few weeks later. Uh, but one can also argue that this Arab Spring in Tunisia started in 2008. Uh, 2008, where there were riots uh, in Gafsa, which is the major uh, mining uh, city in the interior of the country. And UGTT, uh, the acronym for the union, um, so Gafsa as a lost opportunity. They were not organized enough, did not have enough credibility to take the movement forward. So they, when December 2010 happened, the union um, came in and from the get-go um, started organizing and was not going to let that momentum go. They wanted to take a leadership position, if you will, in, um, in, in the process, and they did. You know, they organized, uh, they provided logistical support, uh, but it wasn't because of them that the revolution succeeded. It really was because of ordinary uh, citizens and all kinds of civil society organizations. 2013, when you had the Troika coalition uh, running the country, and because of two political assassinations that took place that year, um, it looked like the country was going to fall apart and maybe even disintegrate into civil war. And you're absolutely correct. I mean, the quartet, you know, four civil society organizations led by the trade union, um, one of those civil society organizations led by a woman um, with that Bushanawi came together and basically saved the day. Uh, they negotiated with the government in place at that time, which was an Islamist government that for the first time in the Muslim country, an Islamist government um, gave its seat of power. And um, the civil society really carried 
the day moving forward. So that history, the, uh, the, the role that UGTT played in the revolution, in a way, echoes the role that they played in bringing about the okay, okay. too. Yeah. And, um, one thing about a revolution, <laughs> as a foreign correspondent, one of your jobs is to stand on balconies and watch revolutions. So I've now you know, stood on a bunch of balconies and watched a couple of dozen of them. And sometimes they fail, sometimes they're bloody and awful, sometimes they succeed. But one thing that happens almost every time is that there comes a moment where the revolutionaries, the protesters, face a moment of truth. Are you willing to stand in front of the gun? Are you willing to trust your comrades? Are you going to see this thing all the way through? And to have bonds of personal trust that are, that are rooted in institutional experience and meetings and, and towns, you know, because of that seemed to strengthen the Tunisian protesters um, when they came under pressure. And that was important because quite a lot of the bodies in the square were out there from another uh, mechanism of letting people blow off steam that was very powerful, which was Facebook, right? So when you do compare the revolution to Egypt, it's not, uh, it's not very easy. But one of the debates that immediately erupted after the Arab Spring was whether somehow the bonds of virtual community were too weak to withstand the kind of pressure that uh, a revolution comes under. What was so interesting in Tunis was you had both things happening simultaneously. You had young people mobilizing themselves through social networks and social media. Uh, and then you had these civil society institutions mobilizing people on the ground as well. So from, my question is, from your study, how did you assess the significance of social media, Facebook, other kinds of viral um, and self-organized communication as a factor in the, in the revolution? I think it played a very significant factor. I mean, you know, ironically, uh, it was under Ben Ali that Tunisia became the first Arab and the first African country to connect to the internet back in 1996. So the investment in, um, in, in the telecommunication, um, the infrastructure was very strong. And then when the regime during the early days of the revolution tried to block communication, uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, they were very clever about sort of, you know, circumventing the uh, blockades that were uh, imposed uh, by the regime. I think social media played a very critical factor, as did arts um, in, in its various forms, you know, hip-hop music, uh, poetry uh, became, uh, you know, part of the culture of the zeitgeist of the um, environment at the time of the revolution. Um, the other thing, you know, besides the society and the role of uh, Facebook and social media and organizing, which are parallels, if you will, with Egypt, the one big difference between the Egyptian scenario and the uh, Tunisian scenario, putting themselves in front of cannons, putting themselves in front of, uh, um, of guns, is the strength of the military in Egypt, which was not parallel in the case of Tunisia. Tunisia always had a very small army, and that goes back to the country's involvement in the Crimean War back in the 19th century, and it maintained a very small army under Bourguiba for a number of reasons, including a lack of trust uh, uh, in the army. It, under Ben Ali, it became a police state, uh, but not an army state, whereas in uh, Egypt, you had both things going on simultaneously, and the army uh, intervened, uh, as we know, and became a deadly threat to the revolution and to the protests that were taking place at Tahrir uh, Square. Uh, the uh, social media also played a very big role in leading up to the revolution. So between 2008 and 2010, um, first you had WikiLeaks, uh, which implicated Ben Ali in, in, in a major way and exposed his kleptocracy, you know, the, um, the reports have shown that between him and his family, um, they had siphoned off about $13 billion uh, during the time of his tenure as uh, president. Then there was Tunis Leaks, uh, which was a Tunisian innovation that also continued to expose 
um, the workings of the regime. And there was a lot of boldness. You know, it was before the actual revolution uh, that people like uh, El General, you know, was writing the songs that have become very popular and widely shared over social media. The self-revelation of uh, Mohammed Bayazizi went viral. Uh, went viral and went also went viral after a while, where the, as people started uh, uh, pulling down statues and posters of Ben Ali, uh, you know, that gave a tremendous amount of energy and reinforcement throughout the country. So I would say it played a very significant role. So you, you mentioned the army, small, maybe 40,000 at the time of the revolution. The other thing that usually happens is there's a moment when the head of the army comes into the office of the dictator, clears out his bodyguards and says, you gotta go. So what do we know and not know about Ben Ali's decision to flee? Why did he make it? Does he suppose he regrets it now that he might have hung in there and been even more brutal? And who was it that persuaded him to go? So there are many different stories, and to you as a journalist, <laughs> you probably know a lot of the inside uh, stories behind this. But I mean, uh, he, I think, well, first of all, he appealed to, to Tunisian people um, on three separate occasions on television. The last appeal he made on the evening of January 13th, the evening before uh, he uh, left the country. The uh, next, and it was obvious by that time that he was absolutely desperate. Uh, he uh, reportedly also met with the head of the trade union on that day and uh, appealed to him to call off the protests that were due to take place the next day on January 14th. And the head of the union um, said he couldn't do it even if he wanted to do it. And the reports that uh, Ben Ali was more indignant than he had ever seen him before. Um, on the morning that he was asked that you know, he reported to the presidential palace, there were protests outside of the palace, uh, protests that have really taken on a life of their own also in the capital city of Tunis. And there are stories about um, a significant personality who played a big role in the, in the police and the interior security of the country, uh, who basically told him, we need you to get out for now, uh, but you'll, you'll be back. Uh, I don't think that he believed it because we know the story about how much he tried to load on his plane between him and his wife. Uh, they took as much of their jewelry and as much of their money as uh, they could have taken away with them. But the head of the army um, had uh, reportedly also issued a memorandum to the, um, to the army units. Uh, basically commanding that they will not fire and stop shooting at stop shooting at protesters. So he also played a very uh, important uh, role in all of this. But I think, you know, the, the Ben Ali on the 14th of January had realized that he had to get out with his life uh, if he could. And there were many uh, around him who helped that happen, including the army, including the intelligence services. Yeah, of course, the as you mentioned, it was the police state is usually located in different nexus than the army, and in this case, it was the secret police and the, and the Ministry of Interior. That was where the roughest business was done, and where after Ben Ali fled, the, the deep state kind of reorganized itself there. It was still, it's still a kind of question in transition as to how you actually undo um, a brutal machinery of that sort that's been built up and resourced over such a long period of time. But let's talk, let's talk about a related subject, the opposition in political Islam and particularly in Nada and the role that it played uh, both uh, before and after the revolution and how it's another anomaly in a sense in that it's a you know, Muslim Brotherhood linked, influenced, um, movement party of political Islam has been around for a long while. Uh, she in exile in London in the early 1990s. It always, in through Ganushi, it always had a leader who could um, speak in so many different vernaculars and, and, and had such uh, self possession about global politics that he um, was distinctive in that respect. But 
um, compared to the, the, the interaction between the experience of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt once it took power and the decision making of the Nada in T Tunisia watching the Muslim Brotherhood fail and eventually be removed is a very interesting kind of element of where Tunisia ended up and where it is now. And I was asking you the other day, why, why did Anada um, you know, agree to forswear the kind of language of political Islam to become a coalition partner, to participate as fully as it has chosen to do? Was it just a tactical response to watching the Muslim Brotherhood fail in Egypt? Or is there something innate about Hanada's strategy, its vision of political Islam that is that is a true example of a democratic party, a more like a Christian um, party in, in, in the Europe or the West? I, I think it's both. I mean, I, I do think that, uh, well, first of all, Rashid al uh 75, um, they're about year old uh, co-founder of uh, an Mahta, which started off at the move on back in 1981, um, is one of the most, uh, one of the shrewdest politicians, and you've met him, and you know him. Uh, actually, my first meeting with him, uh, and I, after the meeting, when I got out, uh, I was with Lee Bollinger, and he said, uh, you seem upset, he said, I am upset because I never expected to like an Islamist. <laughs> and here I am, you know, having spent an hour with this man, and I was really um, taken by his charm and his, uh, his intelligence and his wit. Um, and it uh, you know, reminded me of when uh, Edward Said is uh, quoted as having uh, told um, Christopher Hitchens when Christopher wanted to go to Tunisia um, in the aftermath of the terrorist attack on the synagogue in Jerba in 2002. He went a couple of years later, um, but in thinking about it so immediately after the attack, uh, he asked uh, the late Professor Said what he thought about him going to Tunisia. He said, You should go to Tunisia. Uh, it's the gentlest country in Africa. Even the Islamists there are gentle. Um, so there is, I think, so, so you know, to answer the question more directly, I think. When you talk to Rashid al he tells you that um, Al-Mahda is Al-Mahda, the Muslim Brotherhood is the Muslim Brotherhood, and that he and other founders of Al-Mahda, and Al-Mahda itself, is very Tunisian. So I think it's very important to answer that question, to look at the history of Zaytuna in Tunisia and Al-Azhar Mosque, which is the most important um, uh, mosque university in the uh, Sunni Muslim world, which is based in Cairo. Uh, they have evolved, especially over the last couple of centuries, in very, very different ways. Uh, many of the reforms that facilitated the path for Bergeva post independence came from within Zaytuna. There was a culture of debate within Zaytuna, a culture of reform um, that paid off. Uh, at the end, and Rish Ghanoushi would tell you that he's a product uh, of Zaytuna. Uh, al Azhar, if we have time, you know, we'll talk more about it, but it did not play that kind of a role and continued to be a very conservative uh, place uh, that was played politically and played politics in a very different way uh, in Egypt. Um, so, one is the Tunisian specificity, I think, that gave birth to Al-Mahda, which is, which is quite different. Uh, two, the way the Muslim Brotherhood came into existence back in 1928-29 was a very different environment. It was different circumstances, and even though Egypt was nominally uh, independent, the, it was not. And the relationship with the British uh, colonial power um, was a very strenuous one. And uh, the Muslim Brotherhood emerged in, uh, in Egypt with uh, militancy underscoring it, perhaps not in the mind of Hassan Banna who founded it, but certainly in early adopters of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Sayyid Qutb, uh, you know, when uh, in the 1960s wrote uh, Milestones, which became um, the uh, recipe book, if you will, or the guidebook for um, militant uh, Salafist uh, Islamic movements uh, throughout the world. And Nada didn't have that in its background. It didn't, was not born into that kind of environment. It was born in 1981 
almost three decades after independence, uh, was a product of the Tunian teachings and was a product of uh, Tunisian society and the Tunisian uh, way of thinking. Uh, Rashid Lanoushi himself is also a very adapted person. Um, he spent uh, most, he spent about 20 years in exile, more than 20 years, uh, primarily in Britain. Um, and he claims that that exile helped him, introduced him um, to Western thought, uh, to the writings of uh, Western philosophers uh, that impacted his thinking and his view on things. That long before he returned after the revolution, he had you know, forsworn allegiance to uh, the progress that had been made, for example, in the domain of women's rights in Tunisia. Uh, now, fast forward to the, after the revolution, when the Ennahda came into power between 2011 and 2013, it did try to impose a religious agenda. It did try to impose Sharia as part of the constitution. Um, but when it recognized that it would only fail, it backtracked from it. And there's a famous story about the uh, Shura Council uh, that uh, Anushi had which had insisted and voted um, in favor of pushing for the inclusion of Sharia in the Constitution, which was eventually adopted in 2014. And Rushi convinced uh, the council to change their vote, and they did. 80% uh, voted against uh, pushing for Sharia. And his uh, thinking was that if we push for the inclusion of Sharia, and there is a referendum, um, Tunisians are likely to reject that inclusion. And if through a referendum they decide to not include Sharia, the doors may be closed forever. So let's be smarter about it. Let's not push for this um, and you know, keep the door open perhaps uh, for the future. 2013, what happened with the Muslim Brotherhood and the coup d'etat that took place in, uh, in Egypt uh, was a, a, a factor, and he admits to this. You know, he says, you know, watching what happened in Egypt, we were not going to hang on to power and, uh, and face uh, ultimate defeat. The other very important difference between al and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood has always had a holy agenda. Right, so if you talk to Hazem Kandil or, or read his writings uh, and other people, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood believes in the deliverance of the Muslim nation, the Muslim community, uh, of ridding it of all of the impurities that exist within that community, and only then will God look up favorably upon Muslims and the world. And Nanda did not have any kind of illusions like that. And Nanda from the get-go was not only a, an Islamist movement, but it was a, um, a, an economic movement, a political movement. It, was, it, had, it had a more expansive agenda, I think, than the Muslim uh, Brotherhood did. The last thing I'll say about this is that uh, Anushi, uh, towards the, you know, had a number of interviews with him, but in my uh, latest interviews before uh, I wrote the book, I mean, he said, we tasted power. Okay, we know how it tastes like to be at the center um, of power. And we've tasted being sort of on the outside with some representation in government and working through the system. And we prefer the latter and we think we can be much more effective this way. Now, in Tunisia, you talk to anybody and they either tell you that he is genuine and sincere, or they tell you that he's just playing politics. Um, I say it doesn't matter which way it is, but at the end of the day, he is adapting and the mama is adapting the way he needs to adapt. What happens after the Mushi um, and how the mama breaks up or does not break up, or uh, you know, what younger uh, and not the uh, members and leaders uh, think about things, uh, that's, that's yet to be seen. The one thing that's evident in our shared experience is of, uh, of Anushi is you know, advice for any of you who plan to start a revolutionary movement. <laughs> give a lot of interviews, give a lot of interviews, just say yes to the press people who call you. I mean, there's no revolutionary leader in the Arab world or exiled opposition 
figure who, as a journalist, I knew if I needed to talk to him, I could get to him within 24 hours, and he would, he would spend at least 15 or 20 minutes on the phone. So uh, it's uh, evidence of his shrewdness. But, but what you mentioned about the divided opinion about Anada is one of the stresses. It's still a stress in the post-revolutionary politics. I don't really understand this very well, but I was so struck by the encounter in Tunisian politics. And there's a stress about Islamism. There's also a stress about who was a collaborator and, and where, what did you do during the dictatorship. Those are natural kind of sources of stress after the revolution. But in this age of political Islam uh, being so central to discourse about ideology and political organization in many parts of the world, Tunisia is the only place where I feel like I've encountered a radical, affirmative, open conviction about secularism in a, in a notionally Islamic society. I mean, is the, you used to say, whatever happened to secularism? Well, it's still alive in Tunis anyway. It's, you know, it's socialism, you can call it. Uh, but, so what is that? And it's ardent, and it is not, it is not giving a lot of ground. Uh, it's not interested in making compromises with Anana. It's a, it's a very powerful, positive strain of view. And I don't go anywhere else in the Arab world, maybe in Lebanon, uh, where people stand up and talk this way about a secular constitutional system. Why? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned Jordan earlier on, and one of the things that really drove me and, and I became passionate about Tunisia is because I became very nostalgic. Uh, about my childhood growing up in Jordan um, in a far more modern and secular world than the one that exists today. And um, when you look back at that period, the 1960s and the 1970s, um, countries like Jordan, cities like Amman, had so much potential. And what's really sad um, is how that potential has been has been lost. And you know, I go to Tunis today, and I walk around Tunis, and I travel to Tunis, and it really reminds me of the, um, the you know, far more modern, of course, and advanced version of the Amman that I grew up in um, 40 years ago, and, 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 uh, and more. Um, it's, you know, the, the tradition of secularism, uh, which, again, goes back to the first constitution of uh, the nation, which was adopted in 1861. Before any other Arab or Muslim country, it didn't last for very long. It was, um, you know, an in a couple of years, but it barely mentioned Islam. The 1959 Constitution, the first Constitution after independence, um, included Sharia only when it came to matters of inheritance, because that was a deadline that Mujiba could not uh, could not cross. But just this summer, um, President Esepsi of Tunisia shot the Muslim world when he declared that he was appointing a committee to look into the issue of bringing equality uh, of inheritance. Because you know, as many of you know, a woman in Sharia is entitled to have a man's share, uh, give or take, if there are exceptional circumstances that allow for some deviations. But it's interesting, by the way, and I promise I won't be here for too long. Morgeba, when he knew that that was a lot of that he could not cross, he did everything possible to still give women um, more of a share. So, not moving away from the two thirds to one third, but still giving women far more um, opportunity to inherit. Um, and by the way, as a business professor working in the West studying family businesses, <laughs> if you could get to equality yeah. of, of share, don't you think the Islamic inheritance system is better than ours? If you can get to equality, equality of share, why would it be better? Because it's prescribed. It takes the, it takes the discretion out of the out of the aging patriarch who who, who then you know it discourages family dissolution and conflict. Everyone knows where they stand, and it's you can't mess with. Them. I don't know. I mean, I'm asking from a very personal point of view. Uh, you know, I don't have any children of my own, and uh, you know, anything that I own in Jordan, by the way, I mean, Tunisia is the only place in the world where you can be, uh, where it's legal for you to be an atheist, anywhere in the Arab world, okay, anywhere else in, you know, in, in, in Jordan, it doesn't matter if I'm an atheist or not, as far as the state is concerned, I'm a Muslim, I was born a Muslim and I will die a Muslim, okay, 
and uh, the state will decide how uh, my uh, inheritance is is that is, is that key. And, and it goes in the absence of children. In, in, in the absence of children, it's not a very good system. It's not a good system. But, but being dictated, I would argue, is not a good system. You know, I want to have some say in how it is distributed. But but uh, you know, you do. You get ten percent. It's not discretionary fund. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's one, up to one third of people who will not inherit you. Uh, under okay, the one. Yeah. 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 Okay, the okay. well, last question, and then uh, we'll turn to the audience. The last question for me. Um, I just want to ask very briefly how durable you think this achievement is. And the reason I, I would worry about it is for the neighborhood. Uh, it's a really rough neighborhood, it has been, but uh, you have um, you know, civil war in Libya that's going to go on for an indefinite time. You have uh, Algeria um, in, in a recognizable but unstable condition. And then you have this whole notion of the Euro Mediterranean sphere, given where Europe is headed. You know, Tunisia survived a lot of weather, but I would assume you think that it requires a stable international system supporting and investing in its experiment uh, for at least 10 or 20 years and it's going to get through these patches and, and how like how stable we see the bargain that the world has made with Tunisia now that it's set itself up as a post-revolutionary democracy. So some of my concerns about Tunisia uh, is that historically we have not dealt with bargains with Tunisia uh, for in, 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 in one of two areas. So, so either we have not invested in Tunisia, and I remember you know, Jacob Williams when he was uh, ambassador in Tunisia and I had conversations with him, he would say to me, everybody wants to help Tunisia, everybody in Washington is excited about the democratic transition, but then when it comes time to action, they're preoccupied with what else is going on in the region. I mean, Egypt is a much bigger, uh, there are much greater stakes um, there. Um, so one is, I don't think we have done enough. Um, the, if you look at uh, what the White House requested in terms of the budget for USAID and the State Department for this year, uh, the very meager aid that Tunisia gets, um, it got 170 million this year, about the same amount last year, the proposed budget is for 70 million uh, dollars to go to, uh, to Tunisia, but the appropriations, the House appropriations and Senate committees uh, this summer uh, dictated that um, more money would be, would be gone to Tunisia. And then the other thing is, I think the international donor organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, have really done a horrible job with Greece and Tunisia. Um, we believed under Ben Ali that the economy was good because the economy during Ben Ali's uh, reign was growing at an average of 5% uh, on an annual basis. Um, but in Tunisia, you have the age-old problem of um, a schism between Tunis, the capital, and the coastal area, which has benefited tremendously from trade with Europe and industry and so on and so forth, and the interior of the country, which has been marginalized. So in average um, terms, the country was doing well economically, but uh, what was going on in the interior and the uh, southern parts of the country is uh, was, was miserable and it continues to be. Um, so I think any kind of deals that are uh, brought to bear with Tunisia by international law organizations, by Europe, by the United States, uh, one, we need to take many of these things into consideration. Uh, we need to invest in the country. It is the only success story out of the Arab Spring, with the exception of Lebanon. Um, it's the only democracy in the Arab world, and Lebanon is not a functioning democracy. I mean, and the Lebanon, don't forget, you know, suffered from a 20-year civil war uh, because of sectarianism um, in the country. But, but thirdly, that we tie our assistance also with conditions that guarantee that the democratic process that has started continues. You know, there are many stresses in Tunisia. It is security stresses. Libya next door, you know, the neighborhood and what is going on. Um, but there's also been a tremendous amount of concern um, among Tunisians that some that the tide might be shifting a little bit, that the president is consolidating too much of his power. 
um, that there is talk about constitutional amendments. Um, there was a reconciliation law that was just passed in summer that gives amnesty to public officials who have been part of the Ben Ali regime. Uh, there is concern about Ben Ali collaborators who are re-entering the political scene. So I think the, uh, the country is fragile uh, economically from a security point of view, but also in terms of bringing about political <coughs> stability. And uh, I think any kind of investment, any kind of uh, uh, approach to Tunisia uh, needs to take these things into consideration. The worst thing that can happen to Tunisia, I think, is for it to be pulled closer to the Gulf uh, region in the Arab world, which is the new center of power, right? I mean, you know, the center of power that you and I grew up with uh, is no longer there. You know, the old narratives are, you know, out the window, you know, Cairo, Damascus, Baghdad, uh, no longer there. You know, they are, uh, they no longer matter. It's, it's Riyadh and it's Doha and it's Abu Dhabi uh, that really matter. Uh, today and, and those countries are in, not only not invested in Tunisia's success, they are invested in Tunisia's failure because the success of democracy then uh, puts pressure on us. Let me open it up. We have just uh, these two microphones, so I'm going to sacrifice mine for your sake. Bear in mind that we are recording this, so it'd be helpful if you identified yourself and waited for the microphone to reach out. Let's go from my right to left. So uh, Howard Sean, uh, how do you account for the fact that uh, Tunisia has uh, produced the most terrorists per capita than any other in Africa? Book, I just launched a book about two weeks ago, but in the few launch events I've had, that's always the first question. So it's, 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 uh, and it's a very, very fair question. Um, so, first of all, I mean, and again, I'll, I'll lie back to my engineering business background, and I'll say that the numbers that we're talking about, you know, 5,000 fighters joined ISIS from Tunisia versus 4,500 from Saudi Arabia versus 3,000 from Britain, statistically, uh, those differences are not significant when we compare them to the size of the population or to the overall size of, uh, uh, of ISIS. But they make headlines, right? Because you know, the number one spot um, deserves and gets a lot of attention. Uh, so there are, in my view, explanations for this. One is when, when the revolution happened, um, you had tens of thousands of um, fanatics of Islamists, militant Islamists, who had been jailed or exiled, and they were set free. Okay. Not only were they set free, uh, there was ease of travel in and out of Tunisia. Um, and so, so, so you had that. You had, I think, you know, what, what I would describe as sort of a peak that took place between 2011 and today. Many of those, by the way, did not find the environment conducive in Tunisia for their ideology. Uh, Hazem Amin wrote in Al Nahar uh, about a month ago about interviews he has been holding with, this is a Beirut based uh, prominent journalist, he's been interviewing um, ISIS, former ISIS fighters. Okay? And he ends the article with a quote from a Tunisian ISIS fighter who is married to a Lebanese woman. And Hazen asks him if he plans to go back to Tunisia. And the answer of the fighter was, no, because my wife wears the burqa. She'd like to continue to wear the burqa. I wanted to continue to wear the burqa, you know, the way that covers head to toes. And in Tunisia, she cannot do that. So we're moving to Lebanon, uh, where she can do that. So I think you know, the environment in Tunisia was not necessarily um, uh, wedded to be the ideologies of those people. You had the economy, uh, which really suffered, as we said earlier, in the interior of the country, along the borders with Libya, porous borders with Libya. 80% um, of ISIS fighters who came from Tunisia were trained in Libyan camps. So that was another factor. When the Nahda was in control, 2011-2013, 
there was no monitoring of what happened in mosques. Uh, typically, um, imam preachers uh, are trained by the government to their monitor during that two-year period. There was a lot of recruit recruitment by preachers in mosques of uh, would-be jihadists. So. There are many factors, and I'd love to talk to you some more one-on-one, -on -one, but I uh, think that there are explanations you know, for this, and I think that it is a, um, a phenomenon that has been used. So, yes. I actually, the gentleman stole my question. Oh, okay. Are we going to pass it to the person in front of us? Uh, what do you view, let's say, the top three threats to, let's say, the Tunisian exception or to the Tunisian success as you see it? The top three what? Threats. Threats. Well, I, I, think, I think what I already said, I mean, economic threats, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the uh, growth is very sluggish. Uh, it's about to hit 2%. Uh, you've got uh, more than 60% of the GDP's account. I mean, the public debt is about 62-63% of the um, uh, of, of GDP. You have unemployment that's 40-15%, and it's doubled that in the interior and south of the country. I think security threat, especially from Libya. Um, and um, thirdly, it is the threat of political instability. I mean, I think, you know, we're very quick to judge. So now I read about, um, you know, gloom and doom. Uh, you know, democracy is dead in Tunisia because of the reconciliation. You know? And I remember two years ago when Shahid was appointed prime minister, it was doom and gloom again because he had, uh, he's related to the president. You know? So we're very quick. To, um, to judge that, uh, but I think that there are, there are important signals, there are important things that we need to watch, and uh, that to me would be a huge threat. Um, you skipped at some point a uh, question about the reorganization of the deep state um, and, and the secret and the secret police of the Eastern Interior. So in February, in February uh, 2011, the, the Minister of Interior was uh, attacked uh, during riots. Um, can you tell us about this, how it was reorganized, and how it is reorganized, the deep state right now in Tunisia? Yeah, so, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I think that that is one of the uh, continuing struggles. Uh, I would not say that it has been um, properly or, 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 or anywhere near completely reorganized. I think that that continues to be a problem, especially with the anti-terror law uh, that was adopted uh, this past year, uh, which gives security and intelligence forces a lot of leeway in terms of uh, uh, arrests and in terms of uh, holding up uh, people you know, without, uh, without trial for prolonged periods of time. Um, so I wouldn't say that it has been reorganized. I would say that that continues to be um, a significant, uh, a significant uh, pressure level. Do you like that? Well, yeah. I was just going to say, was there in February watching the tax and interior ministry of those got the, the same thing you saw in Cairo with these plain clothes guys in black leather jackets coming out with pipes and bricks and just beating the crap out of anybody on the street that they ran into. Uh, and then sitting in cafes and watching and monitoring. And what was so striking in Tunisia was the numbers. I mean, this was a very large force as well as a very aggressive force. And you can't just demobilize secret police. Uh, they won't allow it, first of all, because they'll go right into kidnapping and lots of other um, endeavors. Uh, but they haven't been, no one has had, I don't think, the, the power to really figure out how to build a, a transition out of an institution like that. You know, the world has all these models for demobilizing militias and armies and, and, and things you can see and count. But when what you're talking about is a force of unnamed, brutal men in black leather jackets who answer only to themselves, it's very hard to have a UN program to, you know, a UNDP program to demobilize them, and I think they're still there. Yeah. You talked in your book about education and the importance of education. I was wondering if you can compare it with the Tunisian system of education with the systems of education in, you know from the Arab world. Thanks. Nice. So yeah, education also features very uh, heavily in the book because one of the uh, 
I mean, I think that, again, the reform movement that started in the uh, middle of the 19th century uh, that facilitated the emancipation of women and the granting of women more rights than elsewhere in the Arab world, the laws of the society, religion, and secularism. And then a fourth very, very important factor has been the education of Tunisians. Um, the um, trajectory that Tunisia took post independence was markedly different than the rest of the Arab world. Um, in certain so neighboring countries, Algeria, Morocco, uh, post colonialism, the anti colonial sentiments uh, led to erasing anything that was associated with the colonial powers. Um, so, quick Arabization of the curricula and getting rid of the colonial teachers was really the order of the day. Uh, Borgheba declared education as the second priority of the country after the eradication of poverty. He put in place um, Mahmoud Basadi, who was a playwright, uh, who, was, who played the role through the arts in the nationalist movement, who served on the Burgheba as Minister of Education for 10 years. And during that time, um, the education system in Tunisia was declared as bilingual, it continues to be bilingual. Uh, French teachers were retained when the uh, desert crisis with France um, came to a head in 1961 when Bourguiba negotiated for the end of the crisis, the one thing that he insisted on was to make it, uh, to make sure that French teachers would continue um, to, um, to be there in Tunisia. Why he trained, or while the state trained, uh, Tunisian teachers? Um, Tunisia's education system was from the get-go co-educational. Only former French colonies, by the way, in the Arab world have had co-educational um, um, teaching um, um, the schools. Um, and fourth, and I think very, very importantly, if you look at the extreme with Ataturk, uh, who obliterated religion from schools, and uh, there was no teaching of religion, and that did not make it back into schools until the 1950s, and now I think in many ways we see a reaction to um, some of the forced secularization that took place in Tunisia. And at the other extreme, um, you have places, including in Jordan, where um, religion played a very heavy role in uh, curricula and in textbooks. And because of quick Arabization of curricula, the Quran became the example of the, uh, of the Arabic language, um, a religion's role in education systems became uh, over, you know, became very powerful, became very dominant. Uh, not to mention also that in countries from Morocco to Jordan, um, there was acquiescence to some of the Islamist movements uh, that became powerful in the 1970s. And it's not, it was not relevant in Jordan, I can tell you this with, with authority, uh, when King Hussein um, sought to appease them but keep an eye on them, the one thing that they negotiated for and they got was control over the Ministry of Education which they took control over in 1973. And now we're paying the price for that. Uh, it takes place like Saudi Arabia, where a typical student um, has nine hours of uh, religion, uh, classes of religion every week, it has about eight or nine hours, depending on the grade of Arabic, taught through the Quran, and then about three or four hours of the science um, and math. In Tunisia, uh, since the introduction of the education system in 1956, uh, religion is taught in one to two hours a week, and that continues to be the case. It's the only country uh, in the Arab world that I know of where uh, Darwinian theory is taught, uh, where it is a requirement to have two years of philosophy um, in, uh, in high school. So I argue that education um, had a decidedly important factor in preparing uh, Tunisians for democratic transition. Now, the education system over the past 20 years has not been what it was during the first 30 years after independence. Um, and it's come under a lot of stress, but many of its foundational strengths, curricular wise, are still there. And uh, what we've seen in other parts of the Arab world is a further deterioration of the education system and a growing role for the religion of the
Maybe one, one last question. Yes, I, um, I read the book and I congratulate you because I loved it from beginning to end and it really touched me in many ways. And one of the things that I uh, that really resonated for me was about democracy, its fragility, and the many twists and turns that come for democracy in the road. And I wondered, as you were writing it, or since its publication, when you speak with people, how you think about what's happening here in terms of the development of democracy, its fragility in this world, and if you want to make any comments about it. Wow, that's a big question. I think it's, it's uh, I should give uh, Steve a chance to uh, respond to it. <laughs> Turkey, we see that in India, we see that in Hungary, we see that in Israel, and we certainly see it um, here in the United States. As I was writing the book, I mean, you know, the thing that uh, um, I found, I mean, you know, the book is in many ways a personal book, and it's a journey, um, the process of investigation and the process of writing helped me. Um, deal with, address, uh, bring to the fore many of the questions I've had about my region of the world, um, you know, in my, my entire life. And in Tunisia, I found um, something that is very, very special and something that needs to be preserved and something that needs to be um, invested in and, 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 uh, and that perhaps uh, something that can provide inspiration for the rest of the Arab world. Um, I take issue with those who argue that it happened in Tunisia, so it can and it should happen in the rest of the Arab world, that Tunisia can serve as a model, and I say absolutely not. It cannot serve as a model because the ingredients in Tunisia are very specific to Tunisia and they've been in the making for a very long time, to make multiple generations, for example, to, uh, to change and, and, and create political will uh, for education systems uh, to be turned around with the rest of the Arab world. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the stresses that Tunisia is under today uh, are not that different, you know, from the stresses that we face in this country. And I think, uh, you know, we need to continue to do what we do at places uh, uh, that we operate out of to preserve our democratic ideals and to uh, keep pushing forward. I'd just like to ask you to join me in thanking Sakon.